is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dark, Season 1, Episode 10, Alpha and Omega. In this episode, guys, we wind up in the future. How, 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 huh? How did that even happen? What? So much, so much going on this episode. I don't, I genuinely don't know where to start or how to summarize this. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So first of all, I want to say thank you to Michael for commissioning this episode. Um, all right. So I watched this episode live on the Facebook page. If any of you want to go and watch the playback of that, it's on facebook.com slash unspoiled pod. Um, and weirdly enough, there were not that many people in the chat for that, that like even knew what it was that I was watching. This is one of those shows that I am so impressed with that every time I find out once again, how few people are watching it, I'm blown away. Because to me, this like, this should be a a fucking like a standout success. The kind of show that everybody is talking about the way that everybody was talking about Stranger Things when that came out. And the thing about it is that there is no easy way to summarize what's going on in the show. So I feel like Stranger Things, you are able to give more of a... uh, You're able to do a trailer that's a little bit more engaging because there is so much that you can share off the top. And this show, it's like anything you share, you have to be so careful because it's all spoilers. Everything is so intertwined with everything else that there is no way to really like get across what the story is even about without letting like accidentally letting some details slip, you know? So I feel like this show... Is what's great about it is the fact that it is intertwined and that's part of what makes the show so amazing, but it's also a hindrance when you're trying to get people to watch it and you can't fucking tell them anything and you can't send them to a simple YouTube link with a, with a trailer because it's never going to really summarize what's going on, you know? Um, So yeah, I'm just, I don't know, I'm really struggling with that. And I am wanting so much for Owen to continue to watch this with me. And he just, he's really fighting me, guys. Um, All right. So this episode, first of all, we start off with Peter and he is in the parking lot of that truck stop where the trans worker, the sex worker has their trailer. Um... And Peter is like hanging out there in the rain, sort of like watching as she gets out of a car and that car drives away. And it's like he's considering whether to go up to her or not. And he winds up driving away. And when he gets to the bunker, I'm like, what are you doing here, dude, though? Like, why, why is this the place that you come to? I still don't really have an answer to that. All I can think here is that he needs a place where he can go and flip the fuck out alone. And forgive me, guys, I'm going to move my mic a little bit so that I can sit back. So if this sounds really loud on your end, I'm very sorry. Um, guys, I have to confess a little bit of jealousy here. Because it would be so off awesome 
if I had a bunker to go and flip out in? Like, is there anybody out there who kind of wishes that they had this at their disposal? A place underground, essentially soundproof, where you could go and scream and break things and just let fucking loose and nobody's even going to know you're there. Never mind be able to hear you. Like this property is so remote and private that there's no neighbors that see his car pull up and think to themselves, oh, here comes Peter. Like they don't know what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I am absolutely. Uh, I feel so bad for Pete. That's what I'm going to call him. Can I call you Pete? Um, because Peter is down here smacking himself in the face and reciting the serenity prayer. And while I was doing the live watch, I was starting to make a comment on this. But the thing with the portal happened so close behind that I didn't really get a chance to like say what I was thinking. But my question here is, is Peter treating his attraction to that trans woman as if it is part of an addiction? Is that what's implied here? I'm I'm not even sure that this person would want to be referred to with feminine pronouns. It They might be a they. They might like consider themselves just like a cross dresser and not actually a woman. Um, I'm going to try and go with they. But I feel like Peter is sort of it's unclear to me if it is this particular person who poses some sort of like threat to his fidelity. Is he in love with them or is he just extremely attracted to them or is it overall the desire for somebody who is not his wife and that in itself or somebody who is not a cis woman as well, that could be like just what he feels he needs to break himself of. Does this make sense? I just felt so bad for him being in the bunker, literally hitting himself in the face and reciting the serenity prayer, like him being drawn to this person is some sort of illness that he's trying to overcome. And I just, I feel so bad for him. I really do. So he's sitting there, he's reciting this prayer he has his eyes closed and all of a sudden this like blue light begins to play across his face. And I'm sitting there like, what, what is happening here? Guys, when you see this like portal open, I had absolutely no idea what was going on for a moment. I was like, is this in response to his prayer? Like for a split second. And you don't really see that it's like an opening yet. Like it just looks like there's something appearing in the air, like lots of little flecks of light. So for another moment, I was like, oh, my God, are we is there like somebody materializing in front of him? And and the answer to that is like kind of. He watches this fucking portal open and it's not a portal like a doorway. And I want to point that out because later on there is a portal like a doorway. And that's the one that like Jonas and Helga wind up touching hands through. So it's not like that kind of portal is always on its side the way this one is. And I don't know whether or not this is standard, if the other way is standard, if it's a random thing, if it depends on like the positioning of the people on the other side, or if it depends on what time they're coming from or what. I have no idea. But I found it really interesting that they turned out so differently um, each time. So this boy comes fucking dropping through the portal and hits the ground like a sack of wet laundry. And he uh, really his acting in this moment is so good because it turns out to be Mads and he is dead already. But Pete winds up doing this fucking thing. And the thing is, I can't even like be that mad at him because he's trying to help and he just doesn't understand what's going on. So like, why wouldn't he try and help? But the thing is, y'all, he gives this kid, this already dead child, CPR, 
And all I could think was, when they go and investigate this later, his DNA is going to be all over that kid's mouth. And, you know, I'm not even confident enough in the police work around this place to say that they're going to do that sort of like DNA testing, because there has been a lot about the police work in this show that leaves something to be desired. Like I have said it before, and I had rewatched the first couple episodes with Owen, and he also pointed out some of the same like misgivings that I had. For example, when they're all searching the field and walking the field in the very, I think, second episode, and there stands what turns out to indeed be older Jonas on the ridge of a hill in full view. Nobody seems to notice him. Things like that. Um, as well as Ulrich touching the body of the kid before the police actually are able to access him. Like Ulrich, more than anybody, yes, this might be his kid's body. It turns out it is not his body, which really y'all should make a little bit more sure of that before you allow somebody to come in contact. But even if it were your kid's body, you should be very concerned with not tampering with the evidence because they will not catch the dude who did this if you start mixing your own DNA with everything. So I had this instinctive like, oh my God, Peter, don't touch the body. What are you doing? And that it was immediately followed up by, oh, maybe that doesn't matter, though, in this universe. That's the one flaw in this show, I think, is that there is a handling of things that feels really unprofessional at times. And, you know, that could be put down to it being a small town. Um, it could be put down to, like, American procedures are different than German procedures. I have no idea, you know, what the standards for this this kind of thing are. Um, but either way, it just really, I was like yelling at the screen. I was just like, why, what are you doing? And he winds up seeing, like he, he is able to pull the kid's shirt apart and finds this fucking ID hung around his neck that I think is like his passport. Um, yeah, I think so. I'm looking at it right now and it's like very. Is it? I feel like I never got a good look at Mads's face, like when he was healthy and not burned to a crisp. So, yeah, I think it is his face. He looks older in that little picture, but I think it is him. And he immediately calls up Tronte. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is young in that picture. Never mind. Um, and explains to him what he found. And Tronte comes and like, uh, you know, of course, it's just like, what the fuck? This is impossible. And as they're sitting there, like puzzling over what the fuck to do and what could have happened, Claudia walks in and she tells them, I guess I have a lot of explaining to do. But first, we need to take Mads to the place where he is to be found. And there's not much time. What the fuck, Claudia? When she first appeared, my instinct was to be like, does Tronte know some of this is about to happen? Because he was involved with her all those years back. Like, maybe she confided something to him. It seemed like they were not close, though. As much as they were having an affair, the way that he approached her on the first day at her new job is not the kind of thing that a partner who really, truly cares about you and understands you does. So then, I, like, as soon as I thought, has she told him about this? I was like, nah, she definitely hasn't. And then a second later, when she says, I have explaining to do, I was like, oh, yeah, definitely. They don't know anything about what's going on here. So I'm sorry, guys, if you can hear this dog going bonkers, I don't know why, but there it is. So then we have the scene, y'all. Those of you who are patrons and have listened to the Unspookled episodes, you're going to know what I'm talking about. Unspookled is a show that I do for three weeks in October leading up to Halloween, where I read um, spooky stories that are shared by a variety of people. Some of them I find online. I find them in forums. I find them on Reddit. Some of them this year especially were like sent in by listeners um, and there was a particular episode this year that had a lot to do with P 
people showing up in someone's bed or looking over at the bed of their sibling across the room and there's somebody in that bed that should not be there. And this just reminded me of that so much and it fucking freaked me out. So he's sitting there in bed or laying there, Jonas is, and this hand comes up over his shoulder and we know Jonas doesn't have anybody in bed with him. We know this. And the way the hand comes up, guys, I just, uh, and he looks at the hand like he knows there shouldn't be anybody there as well. So he turns over and there's this girl there laying next to him. Is it a girl or is that, oh my God, is that Matt's? Why is Matt's touching his shoulder? No, it's Miko. Because he's got the he's got the skeleton outfit on. Mikko, what are you doing? I don't like this at all. Regardless, he sits up, flipping out. Turns out it was all a dream. But guys, no, 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 no. I don't like it. I don't like this kind of spookiness that's like an invasion of your territory. Does this make sense? I won't get into that too much because I have so much to talk about. But like when you have a place that's supposed to be safe, like your bed, and that thing can get in there, mm -mm, no, I'm out. Thank you. Pass. So then we go to Bartos. Now, guys, I'm hoping that I have his name right. There is nobody in the chat to ask right now. It is killing me, y'all killing me that there's nobody in the chat on the finale episode. Ah, where are you all? Barta (sighs) Is he Noah? I, like, part of me wants to know and part of me I want Noah to never be somebody that I know in this sort of intimate a way. Does that make sense? I kind of like Noah being this weird figment that seems to have like come from somewhere else entirely. But at the same time, if Noah doesn't have a connection with anything, it will feel a little strange. And if it turns out that he is Noah, I am going to have oh, so many questions. I have so many questions anyway. Like, I don't understand what the deal is with Noah. I really appreciated that um, on her wall, because Charlotte has, you know, her wall of pictures, and then she has the illustration of Noah. I appreciate very much that there is a sticky note on his picture that just says, what does Noah want? Because I would also like to know, you know, like, what what does he want? What is he after? It's so the the speech that he gives later sheds no light on anything. He gives a several a couple speeches actually. But so anyway, Bartos is here, and it turns out that he is uh, getting the news from what is her name, Martha, um, about the fact that she kissed Jonas, and. It's obvious that he is kind of fucked up over this, but he forgives her in this moment. And it seems like her emotional state over her brother being missing is a good enough reason in his mind for all of this to have happened. Um, Like he's, he's blaming Jonas much more than he's blaming her. Well, here's the thing is that it sounds like based on his conversation with Noah later, that he is fully aware that Jonas's father was a time traveler and that Jonas becomes a time traveler himself and that he is really going through some shit. So apparently he will forgive Martha for whatever trauma and and hardship she's going through, but he does not extend that same compassion and understanding to, to uh, Jonas at all, which is really interesting to me. Does he actually forgive Martha then? Or is he just saying that he does because he feels like he doesn't really know what else to do with her and it's just easier? Because, you know, I feel like I am somebody who tends to just do what's much more practical a lot of the time in my mind. 
And in, when I say practical, oftentimes what I mean, what's going to have the like best and most efficient result? Usually, whether it's easier or not, doesn't necessarily factor into that or, or like equation. And I forget that there are a lot of people who like default to what's the easiest course of action in relationships, which I find bonkers because like that ultimately will make things more difficult usually. But I have to keep in mind that that is definitely how some people decide to play things. So anyway, Martha tells him and then he winds up in this like scuffle with Jonas later. Guys, he throws things into Jonas's face. Again, I'm assuming that he knows the truth. So the way that he decides to talk to Jonas about his dad is like truly unforgivable in that light. It would have been horrible enough anyway. But knowing that he is fully aware of what has been going on, it makes it even more disgusting. And then he tells Jonas never to come back here, which it, this is his school. I don't, what do you mean never come back here? That's not exactly something that you can tell him to do. Like, what are you even taught? Why are you behaving as if you have the right to restrict his access to school grounds, dude? Um, and this, it's, it's like moments like that, that make me think that he is, uh, Noah, because of this sort of like, sense of authority that he seems to have for no good reason. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't, guys. But anyway, so the whole thing between the two of them, it's like ah, Bartos has this like meetup later on with um, Noah, where Noah explains to him that First of all, Jonas wants to destroy this like portal, but he doesn't know that he's the one who creates it in the first place, which that is fucked up. Secondly, he tells Bartas that Noah or that um, Jonas is Claudia's pawn and that she has been lying to him and that she's on the side of darkness. Uh, I don't know about y'all. I'm not getting that vibe. Um, I could be wrong. Like, the show has set us up to believe that Noah is the bad guy. To be honest, the only evidence that we have that he is the bad guy is him killing these children. And granted, killing children isn't nothing. I mean, that's some strong, compelling evidence. But there are a lot of things that recontextualized can look very, very different from the other side. And there's a chance that there is some key information here that I don't have that would make these seemingly appalling choices make a little bit more sense. I wouldn't excuse child murder, but there could be something that happened that I'd be like, oh, I kind of get why he felt like this was like going to be the way to avoid the most damage in other areas, you know? Um, so I, I'm always suspicious when it feels like I'm being told whether or not somebody is a bad guy. However, I kind of hope that's that I'm not being tricked. I kind of hope that there's no like, oh, you thought he was the bad guy, but turns out that he's actually like, you know, he's got your, uh, he's got reasons for doing things that you would never understand or you need this extra information or whatever. I don't want to be tricked. I want there to be a couple of things that I can grasp and hold on to because this show is so complex that, it's just kind of a lot, you know, sometimes you just need to be able to grip a piece of things in order for all of it to settle and for you to be able to follow. So fingers crossed, I don't know, but we'll see. Um, so let's, let's back up here because 
I, I talked about Bartas and his uh, his meetings with um, with Noah. Noah also has his talk. I'll you know what I'll talk about um, Helga real quick. So Helga, we uh, we have two instances with Helga. We have one in which we see both uh, medium and large Helga, as I'm going to call them, um, together. Helga has come to his cabin and he sees an old man sitting there and does not recognize himself because honestly, like, why would you? It's not until his older self pulls off his hat and he can see the damage to his ear and the scarring on one side that he realizes who this is. And his older self tells him, you can't keep doing this. Noah is full of shit, my friend. Like, buddy, he's lying to you about everything. He is a bad fucking person. I'm pretty sure he calls Noah evil straight up. And Helga, unsurprisingly, is not here for this. Like, he, medium Helga, that is. And he takes off running. Large Helga thinks to himself, yeah, you know what? I don't think you're going to stop. So I guess I'm going to have to stop you. And what follows is him deciding that he's going to get in his car. And I say his car, get in a car. I would love to know where he got this car from. But he gets in a car and crashes into his younger self at an intersection, which winds up killing him and just injuring his younger self, but not actually killing him, which is just really a shame. He's out here trying to correct mistakes. And it's almost like this is and I, I brought this up before. There's a vibe in this show as if we are not able to change the past. Like there, there continually are these attempts made and it's as if they are prevented from doing it. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't, know if it's my imagination. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this is something that it's just a couple of bad tries. But they both of them, Ulrich and Helga, try to kill someone else using means that are sort of like low key unreliable. So Ulrich tries to kill Helge using a, uh, what do you call it? A rock and bashing his head in. Helge tries to kill his younger self via a car accident. Neither of these is foolproof. Neither of these is even necessarily particularly reliable. It's just... Would they have been allowed to just straight up use a gun? Is that something that, how does the past work that this is not an option that occurs to them? Is it simply that like in Germany, guns are not as easily available as they are here in the United States? Because like I could go to the fucking gun store and have a gun in half an hour and be able to kill somebody with it. Or is it, just like whatever you have at your disposal, you're just using. Uh, and if that's the case, is that because they as people haven't planned ahead super well? Or is it because the nature of the past keeps them from tr from accessing successful methods of killing the other person? If they did use a gun and shot somebody in the head, people still survive those kinds of wounds. It's rare, but it happens. Would they? still survive? Is that something that like, you know, is built into how this all works? I have no idea what to think. Um, so yeah, he winds up dead. Uh, large Helga is dead. And the younger one is just, you know, injured in the accident, but he's fine. So older Helga did not accomplish anything. Meanwhile, Charlotte back in the present is trying to retrace Helga's steps and figure out what the fuck happened to him because he also disappeared off the face of the earth. 
And I would like to like remind everybody that this is a series of disappearances happening on the heels of one another in this town. This is not a huge town. And we have first, you know, 33 years ago, we have Mads disappearing. But that's a whole thing. It's long enough ago, you know. So then we come to the present and we have Eric disappear. Then Mikkel disappears. Then that other kid who was uh, dating Charlotte's daughter disappears. Then Ulrich disappears. And now Helga disappears. And soon people are going to notice that Jonas has disappeared. That's six people in the course of what, a few weeks? This is fucking going to start to really get some attention. People are going to want to know what the fuck is going on. Like, that's just, it's too many people, you know? I'm extremely curious because every single person who has disappeared or traveled in time at this moment appears to be male. I do not know if that is significant or not, but I find it very compelling. And we see Claudia in the future and in the present. And I think it's her future, but I, like, I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with Claudia to tell how much traveling she's done versus how much just knowledge she has. I guess she does travel because she's the one who like brings the schematic for the machine to the clockmaker. Right. So she does. Okay. So we have one female traveler and the rest are all men. Um, but yeah, this is just going to start to be like, there's no way people are going to feel safe. This shit's going to start hitting the fan a little bit, I feel like. So then we have a pretty intense scene where Jonas goes to see his grandmother and asks her if she knows about his father. And she tells him that she kind of knew in her gut from the beginning. Um, and explains that like, you know, I just thought that he had maybe just been abused or had just gone through something really traumatic and terrible. And that was why he chose to relate to the world in this way that he was like creating a sort of barrier between himself and reality in order to make it easier to, you know, continue on. But then, you know, gradually as time passes, she begins more and more to believe, I think, because there are probably signs. I would love to have seen Mikkel, like, having some money stashed somewhere. Because if you are from the past, even if you're a child, you have to know that, like, investing in Apple is a good idea. Mikkel's not that young. He's like, what, 12? I, I I would love to see that he had like made use of some of the knowledge and that that had been part of what led to his mother eventually believing him. But regardless, Jonas is really, really mad at his grandmother for not doing anything. He tells her something about how she could have saved Mikkel if she knew all of this before Mikkel disappeared in our time. And the truth is like, it's really easy for him to say you could have, you could have saved him. You could have stopped all this, but there is no evidence to support that. She knows that Mikkel disappeared like, or she knew, I guess. I don't know that she knew exactly who her son was in the press. Like, did she see Ulrich's son and recognize that as the little boy that she met all those years ago? Did she like put two and two together? And if she did, would she want to go and like mess with that and, and, and talk to her son and be like, Hey, is that you? And like, really have this conversation. If she did do that, I would think that she would sort of leave it up to him 
whether or not she should stop him from going across. Like, I would really like to know if she confronted Mikkel with this information when he was an adult and was like, I am starting to see in that kid's face who you used to be. And maybe you were telling me the truth. Do you want me to put a stop to this? Would he want her to? Or would he feel like things happened the way they happened for a reason? Which is what she kind of says here to Jonas. And like, that's all well and good if you gave Mikkel the opportunity to make a choice here. But if you just did or didn't do something because you wanted things to turn out the way that they did, you don't get to go be out here talking about things happen for a reason with this sort of mystical, like, oh, well, you know, some things are just meant to be. You just wanted that to happen. You just wanted to be able to raise this little boy who clearly, like, began to really mean something to you. And that is not the same thing. So I am dying to know what kind of, of choice she gave to Mikkel, if any, how much information she really put together. And... Jonas is just like convinced that if he goes back in time and saves Mikkel, that it will fix everything that's wrong. Now, this is something that I wish he talked with her more about because he doesn't exactly tell her what he's doing. Um, and so she doesn't get the chance to question him about it. But it seems to me that what Jonas wants to do is go back in time and get Mikkel and come back and basically undo his own birth, which is what older him like cautioned him against. And it seems like he's sort of in a place where he would be fine with not being born as long as everything else got straightened out. You know, I feel like al he'd almost prefer it a little bit because he just like is so fucked up over the state of things now that at least you know, he could, he might be erased from existence, but he would be contributing to a world that was more stable and less fucked up for other people and that that would be enough for him. However, it is not clear to me why he thinks this is the only instance of this happening. He seems really sure that he fixes what happens with Mikkel and he fixes everything. Like, Mikkel is just the one case of this time travel shit getting all messy. And other than this, it's never happened before. Or if he fixes this, it won't happen again. I don't know. But it's sort of funny, considering that Mads disappeared, that he it doesn't occur to him to wonder about Mads and his connection to everything. Because... You know, it's, it's, he, he is working with limited information and I, de I totally recognize that. And I'm not trying to like say like, well, how did you not figure this out? Why would he have figured out about Mads? But I do think that the other kid's body turning up in the present, um, when it turns out that, you know, he knows by now what really happened to Mikkel, I feel like he should start to put together that there are more pieces in play than the ones that he seems to think are the the big players. They're only the big players because they're the ones that are directly involved with his life. But he doesn't know about the rest of the town. It's uh, a small enough town that I guess it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking you know what's going on. But it becomes rapidly clearer and clearer that there are more people involved in this than a lot of people who are involved in this are aware of. They don't all know who e each other are, you know? So anyway, th all that to say, Jonas wants to deal with a symptom. He wants to handle the Mickle problem and really believes that if he does that, everything else is going to fall into place. And, it's not, that's not what's going on. He isn't in a position 
to just handle the Mikkel problem in the first place by itself, because he will undo his own existence. And I don't know what other kinds of ripples that will have. But also, he has to see that even if you get rid of Mikkel, that like fucking tunnel is still going to be there. So somebody else could wander through other things could happen. You know, like Mikkel didn't. This is still a question for me. Mikkel didn't go into that tunnel looking to to for adventure. He was out in the woods running with you, Jonas, when he disappeared. So like, this isn't something that people necessarily even have to go and seek out and it's still happening. So you can fix this one thing, but that doesn't mean some other kid running in the woods in the middle of the night isn't also going to be caught up. So yeah, Jonas just, he's got too small a picture in his head. And I wish that he would like open his mind a little bit, but I understand why you wouldn't want to do that because that's really scary. You know, like if you really try and stop and think about all of the potential people that could be involved or the twists and turns, or even worse, if you think about what if there are other places in the world with a portal like this that are also dealing with this? How many other towns out there have this kind of like rift inside them that causes these sorts of things to happen? It just becomes overwhelming. Um, all right, so let's go to Ulrich. <laughs> Ulrich ha is having his picture taken by Egan. And it's kind of amazing, guys. The scene where Charlotte comes across Ulrich's picture is so fucking good. I, oh my God, I was screaming. I was just like, I can't, because a, a part of me was like, it would be really easy as a human being in denial to just be like, okay, yes, this guy looks a lot like Ulrich, looks so much like him, but that's impossible. Of course, it cannot be Ulrich. That is an easy thing to do. And I almost thought maybe Charlotte would go down that path. But when you look at the expression on her face, when she finds this photo, it's very clear that she immediately like knows what's going on. And that is bonkers to me to watch her figure this all out from the outside, having no, but no skin in the game at this point, I would like to point out because she, you know, the only skin that she's got in this is the fact that she is a police officer and it is her job to find out what happened to these people who disappeared. And that's plenty. But she is not one of her children isn't missing or dead. And she like in a, if she's coming at this from a professional standpoint as a cop, that would you would think give her even less motivation to face up to exactly what the truth is here. Because what kind of cop wants to be like, so I'm pretty sure there's time travel happening. Like she has a vested interest in not seeing what's really going on here, if anything. So when I saw her expression and I realized like, oh no, she totally knows the truth of what's, what's happening here, at least a piece of it. It was simultaneously like, I was cheering for her because I really like Charlotte and I admire her so much. She's just a very intelligent, capable, focused character. But I was also like, oh, girl, this is going to be doom for you. Like now that you figure this out, there's so many things that could happen. You begin to pursue this. You wind up time traveling inadvertently or somebody like Noah, who apparently knows a lot of what's going to happen will be aware that this is the point at which you start to figure stuff out and will come and try and like take you out of the equation. I don't know, but I am very worried about her. Um, and Ulrich's getting his photo taken here. And there's this whole thing where like he realizes that, uh, that the guy who arrested him is Egan and he quotes, I think it's like the death metal song that was playing in his room when Egan comes to question him um, in like the third episode or fourth episode. And his realization that this is Egan is like, just, it's great. 
and he winds up getting like dragged away. And as he's being dragged away, he asks Egan, have you started drinking yet? Or does that only happen once your wife leaves you? Ooh, shit. That is, that is a fucking hell of a thing to throw in somebody's face. And Egan, like, it's interesting because he, I wouldn't say Egan believes in time travel, but there is a look on his face when Ulrich yells this at him that makes me think that Egan believes him. And that could come from any number of places. Egan might just think, is this guy talking to me about my wife because he's fucking my wife? Like, that would be where my mind would go if I were Egan. Like, oh, that guy is, you know, telling me because they're having an affair. Or it could be, well, she's been feeling really distant lately. And I have noticed that, but I can't believe that he knows that. And, you know, like not necessarily knowing or believing that he's right about her leaving, but at least this guy knows that there's like a reason to say something like that to him and it would get to him. Um, and when we see this, like, there's a very small scene with Egan's wife a little bit later where the lights are flickering again and she and their border are holding hands and there's just so much tension there. So I'm dying to know, does she wind up leaving him for this woman? Because if that's what happens, I am going to be so excited. Like, that's a very bold move. I would be extremely interested to see that. Um. And what happens later is Ulrich, like, he still has not told them where fucking uh, Helga is. And nobody is interested in playing with him anymore. They're not going to just ask nice. And they all wind up coming to his cell and beating the ever loving shit out of him. And it's one of those things where part of me was like, because they come in and ask him where Helga is. And he won't tell them and they begin to beat on him. And I was like, dude, just tell them. But also a big part of me was like, even if you did, they'd probably still beat the shit out of you anyway, because they believe that you murdered a bunch of kids. And that's pretty much that. Um, but we know that Helga winds up being found. So you know, he winds up being okay. So he must tell them eventually or else Helga manages to get out of there. But like we see him switch places with Joan. So like, I don't know. I really don't know guys. Um, so, okay. Uh, how much time do I have left here? Because I have just been uh, 15 minutes less than God, so much to talk about. All right. So we have the machine um, that older Jonas brings to the clockmaker. And he has figured out that the phone that Ulrich left, he has managed to like to create this like battery for it, which honestly, for the time, is still very impressive. You know, it's not a two ounce flat lithium battery, but nevertheless, he's does impressive work. Um, and he shares that this cell phone somehow has a signal that it sends that triggers a part of this machine that nothing else has been affected by um, or that has not been affected by anything so far. Um, he says it was included in the blueprint, but I never knew what it was for. And he like runs this phone by the larger cylinder and one of the smaller cylinders sort of pops up, but it pops up and then goes back down again. So and I still don't know what this means. Like, is is the signal that it's sending indicating a particular time or what? Why are there three cylinders? Is that like past, present, future? Is it less important than that? More important than that? Um, whatever the case, it turns out that there is this little spot in the machine where you can put a canister of... A radioactive material, CS-137 is what Jonas says, a radioactive isotope of cesium. I don't know what cesium is, but it doesn't probably matter. And this is what he was getting off of that truck. Um, so the scientist is realizing that like, oh, it generates a Higgs field. Basically, long story short, it creates a black hole. And we know 
that Jonas is planning to create a black hole to sort of like get rid of this time vortex, I guess. He's hoping... I'm not totally clear. I don't really know. Is he hoping that the vortex itself will be absorbed by the black hole? I don't know. That's like the closest I can get to something that makes sense to me. And then he says the same thing must have happened during the nuclear power plant incident, which it seems is the moment when this rift was created initially. That seems to be what the common accepted series of events was. The thing is that we are all assuming that the problem that occurred, the incident that occurred with the um, nuclear power plant was actually at its source, the fault of the power plant. But it could have been an incident caused by somebody attempting to close a time travel portal. Like, again, there's so many paradoxes in this show where this thing happens because we know that it happens, but there's no beginning to that knowledge or that decision. You know, it's all it existed before the decision was made and then the decision was made and then it existed because of that decision being made, except that it already existed before that decision was like around and around and around. So there's just a lot of assumption being made about the way that things are working out or have worked out that is all just it's all just speculation. They don't know anything at all, you know? Um, so let's see, I'm trying to make sure that I'm covering everything. We have that like moment where Helga uh, talks to Noah about what they're doing. And it's pretty clear that his faith is shaking, but Noah gives him this fucking speech about, you know, the world being in pain and that he knows that Helga has experienced terrible pain and that it doesn't have to mean nothing, that pain can be part of what makes you who you are, yada, yada, yada. Just in like, in short, he gets Helga back on his side. Um, I have to say too, I know that I'm sure people have said this already, but man, if Noah doesn't look like Jude Law, I just can't not see Jude Law's face. Like it's really a younger Jude Law, obviously, but the the similarities are startling. In you know, and there is a look that Noah has when he's looking at Helga. This like revulsion in his face. I just really like Helga. It feels like is almost a little bit in love with Noah, or at the very least, there's there's a very like homoerotic feel to the confrontation between the two of them here and in the last episode. And I can't help but feel that Noah has to be fully aware of that vibe, you know? Um, so he says, finally, Helga says, who's next? And Noah opens his little book and he says, Jonas. And then we see Jonas coming out of the cave and it turns out that Jonas is going straight to fucking, uh, what do you call it? Um, Mikkel's bed in the hospital because he knows where he is. But as it turns out, these two are laying in wait for him. And he gets chloroformed and wakes up in the creepy fucking bunker room. Don't like any of that. On the way to that room, he passes a young Charlotte and tries to like, he's very cryptic about what's going on and she calls him crazy. And then we see Charlotte in the present finding the photo of Ulrich. Um, and Jonas locked in this bunker. This is when he finds out that this stranger whom he has been talking to is actually himself an older version. And I felt very gratified. I don't know how many of you knew this already. Like, am I just super smart? Or had everybody pretty much figured this out? I feel like 
y'all had to have figured it out, right? I, I don't, they're treating it like it's this big surprising reveal, but I feel like it's kind of obvious. So I'm unsure because to me it feels obvious, but because of how the show behaves with it, I'm like, maybe it's not, but you know, HBO did something similar with a show. I won't do spoilers for that. And it seems like a lot of people had figured it out before that big reveal on there as well. Um, not me, I should say. I think I figured it out one episode prior. But a lot of people seem to have had it figured out a bit before that. Um, but yeah, this uh, older version of himself tells him we're not. He says, why did you kiss your aunt? We're not free in what we do because we're not free in what we want. We can't overcome what's deep within us. And Jonas starts crying and says, stop, please stop. And I felt so bad for him in that moment. This is a really interesting idea that like, we aren't free in what we want and what we want, our motivations for everything drive what we do. So we can act as if, yes, we have this option, like technically, but if we are trying to get what we want, which we're always trying to do, we're like, we really only have one option, you know, when it comes down to it. And he, he sort of like makes it sound like everything is predestined. That nothing is a choice, which is part of what I've been struggling with. Um, and he tells him, I want everything to go back to normal. I have to bring Mikko back. And it's just like so obvious that that is not going to do the job, dude. I get why that's what you're fixated on. Of course you would be. But like, no, dude, that's not it. So the older version of himself is just like, dude, sorry. If I let you out now, that will fundamentally change who I am in the end. And I can't risk that because I have got some shit to do. So he leaves Jonas locked up in there. And then he goes and uh, performs this thing in the tunnel with the machine. And this leads everybody in town. Like there's all these different people waiting for this because apparently like Claudia explained what was going on um, or at least part of it to Peter and Tronte. So they're waiting and they're like, they're, he says like Mika will still be alive to Tronte. And I'm like, how? What do you mean? Like, does he think that he can, that doing this is just going to break the whole thing and undo all of it? He can't really think that. But regardless, like, I don't, I don't, I, I want to trust Claudia, but I can't. I just don't know en enough about her. Um, so this machine begins to go. And I should mention that after Nick, um, after Jonas does this, he like turns his head to the side and looks at the version of his father that's covered in this like black oil. And I, I totally forgot that there was a period in that first episode where he kept seeing his dad and he kept seeing his dad covered in this oil. At one point, he even dreams that he's looking in the mirror and the oil begins to like come out of one of his ears. And... I don't know what to make of this. I don't know why he sees his dad sitting there. I don't know what the oil itself is. I don't understand any of this. Um, so then we get the shots of everybody like waiting as this fucking huge dark sphere begins to appear over the town. And then we see the portal begin to open in the bunker room, both for Jonas and in the outside of the bunker room, where uh, very young Helga is. And I was yelling, like, don't touch each other, because I really felt like that was going to lead to something terrible happening. And sure enough, they get pulled through to where each other is, or so it seems. It turns out that's not what happened. Helga, yes, gets pulled to where Jonas was, I believe. I think he is in 1986. I might be wrong, but that's what it looks like. For his part, though, Jonas winds up in the future and he is standing in the bunker where I think Claudia has her like hideaway because we saw her standing in the woods with a rifle surrounded by like falling ash. So I assume that was in this 
period. And she, we also saw her like standing in front of the wall covered in photos and everything. So he like winds up wherever she's at and then comes out and wanders around this wasteland where his town used to be. And there are charred cars and barrels with fire and the fucking uh, two nuclear power plants have been like blown up. Like there's just pieces left of them. I really want to know the significance of his bright yellow coat because it just stands out so much in comparison to in comparison to the landscape in comparison to what everybody else is wearing but he winds up uh getting dropped on by a bunch of people in what looks to be like a military vehicle that has clearly been acquisitioned by civilians they are all wearing coverings over their mouths so that they don't inhale the ash. And they come up to him basically like wanting to know what the fuck he's doing out here. And the girl pulls hers down and stares down at him and she's got a cut across her face. And I don't know if I'm supposed to like know who she is, but I have no idea if she's somebody like... I, I was trying to think of, is she the grown up version of like Charlotte's daughter, maybe? Um, but she isn't blonde, so I don't think so. Um, but regardless, he says, what year is this? And they do not answer him. He just sees a plane going by overhead and it looks like a drone. It's got like the uh, the three horizontal fans the way that drones do and he sees it going by overhead and realizes and she says welcome to the future and bashes his face with a rifle butt so they must know about time travel now and i have no idea what happens next after this i got nothing oh my god you guys i'm dying so that is the end of the episode um Thank you very, very much to Michael again for commissioning this episode. I'm so sad that there was nobody in the chat for this one, but hopefully next time. And I just really, really enjoy the show a lot. I have, n I have no like theories that hold any water at this point. The only thing that I figured out was Jonas and that's it. Other than that, I just like, I've been wrong about so much. Um, all right, guys, thank you again so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and I will see you again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers.